We're coming on the air with new steps from President Biden to try to punish Russia and hold them accountable, basically pointing to the rest of the world and saying, hey, NATO is united against you. And a new call to kick Vladimir Putin out of the G20. What President Biden is now saying the U.S. will do if Russia does use chemical weapons, if that were to happen. Plus, the exclusive story of an American pastor who was kidnapped in Ukraine. We've got those dramatic details coming up just ahead. And New York's mayor giving a special exemption to players like Kyrie Irving, who have not been vaccinated. Why some are saying, hey, Eric Adams, that's a double standard for the rich and the famous. We've got that coming up in just a little bit. Plus, new details about so-called forever chemicals in the stuff that your fast food comes in and those classroom culture wars you know that some of these school board members are on the front lines we've also got a new report laying out the dangers kids could face inside the metaverse our kate snow gives us the backstory of what happened when she went inside to see for herself later in the show Hey, I'm Hallie, and just now President Biden is really pushing leaders on the world stage to isolate President Vladimir Putin even more. It's the country shows no sign of backing down in Ukraine. For the first time, the president says he wants to boot Russia from the G20. That's a group of the world's biggest economies. And he's issuing this warning to Vladimir Putin that the NATO and the West are more united than ever. The single most important thing is for us to stay unified and the world continue to focus on what a brute this guy is. And so here's the latest moves that President Biden is taking. He's saying that the U.S. essentially is going to be sanctioning a number of people, members of the Russian parliament, that's called the Duma, oligarchs, financial executives, Russian defense companies, too. He's also saying the U.S. will welcome as many as 100,000 refugees from Ukraine. He's expected to maybe, maybe meet with some of those refugees tomorrow when he goes to Poland. He could also head to the Ukrainian border. And here's what else he's announcing. More money for Ukraine, about a billion dollars for humanitarian humanitarian assistance, more than $11 billion over five years for food security, and $320 million for what they're calling human rights and democracy funding. That actually includes things for, for example, documenting the potential of war crimes committed by Russia. And it is that issue that Ukrainian President Zelensky, Vladimir Zelensky, is focusing on. You know, he addressed this NATO summit himself earlier today, and he claims that Russia is using phosphorus bombs. That's something that's banned by the Geneva Conventions. Neither NBC News nor the Pentagon can confirm that, by the way. That's something that we have to note. And Zelensky's not giving specific evidence, but the U.S. is getting ready just in case Putin does use chemical weapons. Here's what the president said about that. We would respond. We would respond if he uses it. The nature of the response would depend on the nature of the use. I want to bring in Josh Letterman, who is live in Brussels for us now. Josh, here's the thing. There have been so many developments just in the last few hours here and a couple of significant headlines from President Biden. Yes, more money, more aid headed to Ukraine and also for Ukrainians here coming to the United States potentially, but also this threat to maybe kick Russia out of the G20 and then to issue some kind of NATO response if Russia were to use chemical weapons. He didn't get super specific on that second point, but how much is Russia paying attention to what the president's saying here? Well, clearly the Russians are paying attention. In fact, uh, the Russian foreign ministry spokeswoman has just put out a statement, Hallie, uh, calling this the zombification of NATO, essentially saying that this was all a kabuki theater designed to drum up a Russia phobia, but that there's nothing new that's coming out of this. Uh, but clearly you see the West, the U.S. and its allies struggling to figure out, OK, what can we come up with that's going to put even more pressure than everything we've done so far? Because let's face it, what they've done so far clearly hasn't changed President Putin's calculus. So, okay, can we kick him out of the G20? We kicked him out of the G8, uh, now called the G7, after the last time Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. But there's not a lot of indication that President Putin particularly cares if he's kicked out of the club I of the G20. We do know that he's paying very close attention to the economic consequences, which are very significant. That's a good point, Josh. You know what I mean? Because it, he, it, we used to call it the G8. We don't call it the G8 anymore because of what Russia did in 2014. There's this other piece of this, though, which is sanctions, right? And you had, for the first time, the U.S. sanctioning essentially like an entire legislative body, right? The Russian Duma, basically, their lawmakers, 300-plus yeah. of them. And the president was really specific about the intention of sanctions and the purpose of sanctions. I want to play a little bit of what he had to say. Sanctions never deter. 
the maintenance of sanctions, the maintenance of sanctions. We will sustain what we're doing, not just next month, the following month, but for the remainder of this entire year. That's what will stop him. And that's, I think, a really clear window, uh, Josh, into, into how the president views these punitive actions. Yeah, and the White House has been getting kind of hung up, Hallie, on the terminology and did Biden ever say deter or not? But it's kind of missing the point, right? Because either sanctions are meant to prevent a war from happening or they're not. And you can't unring that bell and this idea of maintenance of sanctions and over time the pressure grows. Okay, but the war is happening. So you can make an argument that sanctions are intended to get Putin to pull back a war and to end a war. But that certainly was not the rationale uh, that the White House and other uh, AIDS had made when they put these sanctions into place. Uh, and I think that the reason that they're having difficulty explaining this is in part because so far what they wanted to get out of these sanctions, which is an end to this conflict, hasn't happened. Really quickly before I let you go, I want to play something that the head of NATO told our own Lester Holt, who Josh, as you well know, is with you there in Brussels. He has traveled overseas for the president's trip. As it relates to this discussion about what happens if Russia does actually use chemical weapons, I want to play what um, the, the NATO head Jan Stoltenberg told Lester. Do you take anything off the table when it comes to responding to chemical weapons? We are in a very dangerous situation. So if I started to speculate about the different options, I would only make an unpredictable and dangerous situation even more dangerous and even more unpredictable. My main message is that we are there to protect and defend all allies, protect and defend every inch of NATO territory. And Josh, real quick, the U.S. is seeming to get ready for what could happen in the worst possible case scenario with these so-called Tiger teams, right? That's exactly right. They're looking at what is the U.S. going to do if Russia uses chemical weapons, biological weapons, or God forbid, uh, nuclear weapons. But they have been very reluctant to lay that out very specifically. Biden saying, essentially, we'll respond in kind to whatever the Russians do. They don't want to get baited into something where the Russians uh, use something relatively minor in the you know f scale of what they could potentially use. And then the U.S. and the West get pulled into some major confrontation. But the reality is they haven't been able to articulate exactly what that red line is and what the consequences would be for crossing it. Uh, and that is getting a lot of criticism yeah. given uh, the way this has played out in the past, including uh, President Biden's former boss, former President Obama, who set a red line about chemical weapons use in Syria and then didn't enforce it. Josh Letterman, thank you for being live for us in Brussels. I know it's been a long day, a long night. It's another long day for you soon. Uh, I appreciate you being with us. Thanks. I want to turn now to an exclusive story out of southern Ukraine, where apparently Russians have kidnapped an American citizen working as a missionary, according to his family. We want to show you 50-year-old Dmitry Bodiu and his wife, Helen. She tells our Gabe Gutierrez that their son has not been heard from in nearly a week. Here's what else we know about him. He's a Ukrainian immigrant, but the two of them have lived in Ukraine for the past 30 years. His Instagram says he's a pastor at the Word of Life Church in Melitopol. Right now, neither Ukrainian officials nor the State Department are commenting. I want to bring in Gabe Gutierrez, who is in Lviv, Ukraine. Um, and Gabe, I know that you've been reporting on this. Our NBC station in Dallas has been reporting on this, too. Talk to us about what we know and what has happened here. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. We've been tracking uh, Dimitri's family members really across the world. Uh, yeah. KXAS, our station in Dallas, spoke with him near Fort Worth. I just spoke with his daughter, who is living in Hawaii right now. But this is quite uh, a story, Hallie. His family says that um, Dimitri was abducted on Saturday when eight to ten armed Russian troops came to uh, a home they were staying in uh, in Melitopol in southern Ukraine, and essentially. His, uh, wi his uh, wife told uh, her daughter that uh, the troops had asked if he was an American. Hmm. Um, and so they haven't heard from him since Saturday. Again, our station KXAS in Dallas spoke with his father just a short time ago. Take a listen to what he had to say. My spirit okay, but body sometime. <laughs> I believe God, I trust God. But uh, my emotional sometimes, you look at me, I am so, my son more stronger. But I believe God saved him. If not safe here, he saved forever and forever. 
So yeah, Hallie, at this point, the family's still waiting for word and they haven't heard from him uh, since Saturday. He was a pastor of a well-known church uh, in that area. So they don't know, for example, yeah. if you know he, he may have been perhaps targeted because he was an American was or perhaps because he was well-known in the area. They wanted to see if he was you know, bad-mouthing yeah. the Russian troops in any way. They took his family's phones. They then returned the phones uh, a day or two later, but still no sign of Dimitri. Well, that was exactly the question that I had for you, Gabe, if there was any suspicion that he was targeted because he's an American in this instance. And it sounds like we just don't know. We just don't know a lot about this yet. We don't know uh, at this point. And I did speak to his daughter, uh, who is in Hawaii, and a little bit more about this couple. You know, that he, uh, according to his family, had come to the United States when he was 17 with his parents, uh, then spent a few years there, met his wife there, and then they moved back to Ukraine. But he traveled fairly often back uh, to the United States, at least twice a year, to see family. Uh, they say he also preached uh, in the United States. He had a lot of family around the Texas area near Fort Worth. But again, he. Uh, Actually, his daughter told us, very interestingly, Hallie, that he actually lived for a time in the Crimea region mm. uh, when it was uh, annexed, until when it was annexed in 2014, and he left back then because he was a U.S. citizen. So still a lot of questions yeah. on this one, Hallie. There is a State Department, as you uh, may have mentioned, has not commented on this. They're aware of those reports. Ukrainian officials have not commented on this either. But meanwhile, you know, the family is waiting for word. And as can be the case in these situations, you know, uh, it, it is a very sensitive time because, you know, you don't know what the status, if any, of those negotiations are, if anybody's been in contact uh, with the Russians. Yeah. Now, um, you know, the family is just just waiting, waiting to hear um, if they if they can hear, you know, if, if anything comes of, of these developments. And it's just devastating to know that he is, in, you know, in a place where he, he can't be reached. We spoke with his wife by phone. She still has um, spotty cell phone service. She is still in the area. But at this point, they just don't know where he is. It's Alex. just uh, it, 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 I'm sure terrifying for this family, Gabe, as they try to figure out where he is. Um, and as you know, there are these continue to be reports that while Russia is advancing on cities like Mariupol, continuing to shell there, the Ukrainian military is putting up some resistance. Gabe, we're really glad to have you there on the ground in oh, Western. And yeah, yeah, go. And, and really quickly, Hallie, I forgot to mention, you know, this something else is, uh, that's raising alarms here is that this is the same city where earlier this month the mayor was abducted. And he was later released as a part of a prisoner swap. Remains to be so seen whether, you know, the Russians, yeah. you know, could be trying to trade him for something else. But that's a question. But, yes, the mayor of this town just a few weeks ago was released after being abducted for several days. People becoming political leverage in this instance, Gabe. It is um, difficult to hear about. Thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Turning now to some news back here out of Washington. And Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, in just the last hour announced how he plans to vote on President Biden's Supreme Court pick. And let me just tell you, the answer is probably not going to shock you because he's going to vote no. Here's what he said. Nothing we saw this week convinced me that either President Biden or Judge Jackson's deeply invested far left fan club have misjudged her. I will vote against this nominee on the Senate floor. Jackson's confirmation hearings ended today after more than 33 hours of testimony and four days of hearing from Jackson and her supporters in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Garrett Haig is all over this and joins me now from Capitol Hill. Garrett, I feel like a little bit like it's the headline of like dog bites man. Like nobody thought Mitch yeah. McConnell was going to actually support Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, but he is out here making it official. There is an open question now. Will any Republican get on board to support Judge Jackson? And let's be clear, Democrats don't need it. They have enough votes on their own, assuming that they all stick together. And it sounds like they will. And Vice President Harris will break the tie. But symbolically, do you think they could peel off some of these more moderate Republicans like Susan Collins? I assume Lindsey Graham, you know, you talked to him today. That doesn't sound like that's going to happen. History suggests it's possible that Democrats could pick up a couple of Republican votes here in fairly recent history. Now, McConnell coming out and saying he's a no vote, while not surprising, is an important domino it's to a fall. Tone it starts center, to, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And it starts to shake loose the 95% or so of senators who have known probably since the moment that Judge Jackson was announced as the nominee how they were going to vote, but now feel like they're that the confirmation hearing is behind them, that perhaps their own individual meeting with her is behind them. They can start to say how they're 
are going to vote. Now, for Republicans who are liable to vote in her favor, I start with two, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski. Both have voted for nearly 90 percent of Joe Biden's judicial nominees. Both have met with Judge Jackson, and Susan Collins has come out and spoken quite favorably about her. Now, the third person who voted for Judge Jackson in her confirmation of this current role is the aforementioned Lindsey Graham. And if you watch Lindsey Graham over the last couple of days, he's really been Judge Jackson's primary antagonist. He was going after her on defending Gitmo detainees. He was going after her on for her sentencing in these child pornography cases. And when I caught up to him today, I pointed out to him, Senator, this was all stuff you knew when you voted for her the last time. How do you explain that? Listen to what he told me. I didn't even go to the hearing. I thought she was qualified to be on the circuit court. This is a different game. You don't seem inclined to vote for this one. I'll just say so. <laughs> why do you keep saying that? If you know how you're going to vote, why not just say so? Uh, because I'm going to tell the, the country when and on my terms. So while Graham may want to squeeze some drama out of his no vote here, and you, know, you see him saying a Supreme Court seat is different, I think that could potentially also cut the other way with some other Republican senators. Specifically, I'm thinking about folks like maybe Roy Blunt or Richard Burr, or senators mm. who are retiring. They don't care necessarily what the most conservative of their voters think anymore, and maybe they want a vote for the first African American on the Supreme Court to be part of their legacy. Neither of them has said how they're going to vote. There, too, I'll be watching next week, Allie. Garrett Haig, we'll be watching you next week, too. Thank you much, friend. Appreciate it. So not long before we came on the air, we learned of this new lawsuit from former President Trump against his former political rival, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and the Democratic National Committee, and a whole bunch of other people. So why is he suing? Well, he wants $24 million in damage over the 2016 presidential election that Donald Trump won. This lawsuit claims that Clinton and the DNC were conspiring to, quote, Weave a false narrative that the former president and his campaign were working with Russia to rig the election. It calls the scheme so crazy that, quote, the events of Watergate pale in comparison. No reaction yet from Secretary Clinton or the DNC, but I want to bring in Pete Williams here. Okay, what do we need to know about this? You need to know that it's 108 pages long. You brought it with you. Uh, right, this Pete is with it. The props, thank and you. And it's, it's filed against not just Democrats, not just her campaign but also against the people behind the Christopher Steele dossier and then former officials of the FBI and John Doe's and corporations yet to be named. So on the one hand, uh, the, the lawsuit does sort of aggregate uh, a number of complaints that the former president has made over the years about people trying to connect him to the Russians. Yeah. He points out that there were missteps along the way, that the Steele dossier contained a lot of things that we now know were false, that when the FBI applied for the Carter, Fa uh, Carter Page FISA warrant, there were things in there that weren't true. Uh, he claims that data was stolen from his campaign, that it violates uh, the federal law. So he puts this all together in a Cuisinart. He presses pulse. And, uh, and out pops 100 plus pages. Yes, and right. I, think, I think sort of, you know, it's, it, there, there are some things in here that, are, that he says that are true, that, that, were done against, that were done against him that were wrong. He's right about that. Um, the challenge, it seems to me, is, number one, trying to connect these various webs the Clinton campaign here, the FBI here, the Steele people here, and to say they were all in this huge conspiracy is a stretch. He is right about one thing. They were trying to get him defeated. Now, that's, of course, what every political candidate sure. does, and is that a basis for a lawsuit? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a stretch. And the other thing is this. The, the, I, one of the reasons I brought it here is that the the plaintiff is just plain Donald J. Trump. It's not the Trump organization. Mm. And because of that, that means that any of these people here, in, if, the, if this thing ever gets beyond dismissal, can seek to depose him. Any, any one of these, all of these, each of these, can seek to depose him. So if they do that, and of course he'll resist that, this thing could go on forever. So perhaps... Perhaps one of the motives behind this is just to say, to remind everybody, look, I was wrong. Right. This was done to me, and it's wrong. And maybe that's, that's really what's a lot to it. I think one other interesting thing sure. is the lawyer behind this is, a, is, a, is a, uh, a lawyer from Miami named Peter Tickton. Peter Tickton was, in essence, in high school at the New York Military Academy with Donald Trump and, in fact, has written a book about his experiences of knowing Trump then and continuing to know him since then, so they're, they're, they're friends. What, if anything, in this graduates this document that you have in front of us from an airing of grievances from the former president to a legitimate legal case against his former rivals? Well, I, th I think that's the big question. And, you know, the, the answer may turn out to be nothing. 
Um, we'll, we'll just see whether he's successful with any of this. I, I will say it, it was, it's going to take years for all of this to work out. And so perhaps one of these things he's trying to do here, and, it, you know, let, let's give him benefit of the doubt. Maybe he really is trying to get $24 million back that he thinks that he had to spend wrongly to defend himself against a lot of these accusations that, to his defense, turned out to be wrong. Uh, on the other hand, maybe it's, in a, it's a shot across the bow of anybody who wants to try to repeat these things if he does decide to run for president again. Pete Williams, uh, bring, in, bring in the receipts, if you will, right on set. <laughs> Pete, thank you. Good to see you. Appreciate you it. So if you heard about this, there's a bunch of backlash this building. I hate to use a cliche like that, but it's true, right? That's what's happening in New York right now, because the mayor there has lifted the city's vaccine mandate for performers and for pro athletes. Just for them, right? So basketball stars like Kyrie Irving, he's exempted. We've been talking about him on the show. He hasn't been able to play home games for the Brooklyn Nets because he is not vaccinated. That whole ordeal was a huge controversy. Now he's kind of off the hook after Mayor Adams did what he did made this move earlier today, saying he was unafraid. Watch. I'm the mayor of the city, and I'm going to make some tough choices. And people are not going to agree with some of them. And today, the decision we're making, we're not making it loosely, haphazardly. We're not doing it because there are pressures to do it. We're doing it because the city has to function. We're leading the entire country, for the most part, in unemployment. I want to bring in now Stephanie Gosk, who is joining us now. And Stephanie, um, what's interesting here is some of the backlash that Mayor Adams has gotten, including from, for example, teachers or law enforcement officers and these unions who are saying, OK, if you're like famous and artistic, you get to get out of this. But if you're doing yeah. the work of the people in the streets, you can't have an exemption. Like, how is that not a double standard? Yeah, a lot of people are crying foul here, Hallie, is even though there are tons of people that want to see Kyrie Irving play for the All Brooklyn right. Nets, there are also 1,400 municipal workers, according to the city council, that have been fired, aren't getting paid. These are police officers, firefighters, teachers. And they're saying, well, hang on a second. You're, you're going to let Kyrie Irving play basketball, and you let them— uh, unvaccinated Mets and Yankees, whoever they may be, play uh, at home. So how come I can't go to work? And, you know, and there, there's certainly some truth to that. You also do have to consider, in the defense of, of the city and as they're looking at this, that their jobs are extremely different, right? If you are a police officer in this city or a firefighter in this city or a teacher in this city, you are coming into contact with the public in an entirely different way. But out of the other side of the mayor's mouth, he's saying, listen, vaccination rates are super high, cases are low, or at least hospitalizations are low, deaths are low. And if that's the case, why can't everyone just go back to work, Hallie? You, you make an interesting point when you talk about specifically the, the police officers here. The, the head of the New York North's biggest union was saying, if the mandate is not necessary for famous people, then why is it not necessary for cops? So I wonder, Steph, given the, the, the lawsuit that the New York City Police Union has been, you know, pushing against the city for a while now, like, could this not end up a part of that legal case, right? Like, like this exemption for entertainers, couldn't that play a part in that suit? Oh, it, it absolutely will. And the arguments for allowing them to go back on the court, that they might be a risk to the public, they, certainly that's going to become a, a part of the case. And, and like, you know, like I mentioned, they will also point out that coming into the public is really the issue here. And, and, and really, you have, you know, New York City, Hallie, had some of the tightest restrictions when it came to mandates and vaccination requirements, and they're rolling a lot of those back. Masks uh, for for kids at school from K to 12. You have later on uh, in April, in just a couple of weeks, younger kids are going to be able to take their masks off if if they want. And so you're seeing all of these layers peel off, and the people that are still being hurt by some of these mandates, people who didn't get vaccinated but want to go back to work, these municipal workers are basically just kind of sitting there going. I, I, how come like, it's not us as well? Correct. Like, wait, what? Real quick, Steph, any reaction? I mean, Kyrie Irving, for better or worse, has become kind of the face of this. Any reaction from him? Will we see him on the court soon in New York? What's the deal? Uh, Sunday. Look, the NBA okay. playoffs are about to happen. And, you know, there could be some people who didn't go to the games because Kyrie Irving, one of the best players in the league, wasn't there. I mean, Kevin Durant's pretty good, too. But this definitely improves their <laughs> chances in the playoffs. Stephanie Goss, good to see you. Thank you so much for nice being on and breaking too. that down. Appreciate it.
Still to come on the show, the spring break crackdown, it is on. We'll tell you what Miami Beach is doing to crowds in Florida about all this. Plus, some governors are trying to give you a little bit of an assist at the gas pump, but is it enough? We're going to check in with Miguel Almaguer in California, where gas prices are above six bucks in some places. So some states all over the country are doing what they can to try to give drivers a little bit of relief from the price at the pump, right? Because you know that price is going up. You've got more than 20 states that have now introduced bills that would create a gas tax holiday for drivers. Look at your screen. Those are the states there. And New Jersey just today, look at this, was the latest, proposing a plan that would lower the state gas tax from 42 cents to about 15 cents just for a couple months. On the other side of the country, California Governor Gavin Newsom announced a $9 billion plan this week to give registered car owners $400 debit cards to help with the cost of filling up. So basically 400 bucks on your debit card. If you got two cars, you get 800 bucks. If you have an electric car, you can still qualify. The whole thing has to be approved by the state legislature, but it's really relevant in California. And you know why? Look at this. That's the average price of a gallon of gas in California. Man, six bucks in Los Angeles, close to that around the state. Miguel Almaguer joins me now. Miguel, I got to tell you, I hope you drive an electric vehicle, my friend, because that is outrageous. You know, it's a lot of money. This is a lot of money, and this is a big deal proposal. Tell me what you're hearing about it today. Well, Hallie, among drivers, there seems to be pretty widespread support for the plan, as you can imagine. Keep in mind, as you mentioned, here in Southern California, we're paying about six bucks a gallon, and many gas stations locally here are creeping into the $7 range. Motorists say relief is needed, especially for those who commute longer distances. California's governor, as you mentioned, announced his plan last night, which essentially would give every registered car owner a $400 debit card. Here's what a few folks had to tell us. If our government is going to continue to help even just a little bit, that's a good thing, rather than not helping at all. We would be really grateful. We would be very grateful for that. Hallie, I don't have an electric car yet, but I do have a short <laughs> commute. Still, it's quite expensive, I got to tell you. Uh, I ride my bike to work, Miguel. So, I mean, there I you hear go. you on that, you know, because gas prices in D.C., as you can imagine, are kind of outrageous, too. Here's the interesting thing, though, about some of these proposals. And it's, it's sort of relevant in California, but also across the, the East Coast, where this is happening in, in New Jersey, in Maryland, in Georgia. Um, it's temporary, right? So even though you're getting a break in a couple of months, you might, you know, the hammer comes down again, right? And that's, I think, the problem on the federal level when you have lawmakers who are looking at the federal gas tax holiday saying, hey, if we take it away now, we're going to have to put it back in place later, and it may hurt even more then. Absolutely, and experts have debated over the significance of actually suspending the gas tax. While in theory it should trickle down to the pump, that's definitely not a guarantee. Remember, individual gas stations set their own price, so both the crude supplier and the station's owner would have to pass on that savings, and some are simply worried that won't happen. Plus, taxes, both state and federal taxes, are only about 15 percent of the cost of a gallon of gas. So that brings us back here to California, where the plan is to give that $400. And some critics are saying that money's not going to the poorest families. So there's that debate as well, Hallie. Um, can they only spend it at the gas pump, Miguel? No, you can spend it anywhere, but the question is, you know, will everyone use that money just to get, get by on gas? Prices are continuing to go up, and again, we're, we're, we're talking $7 here in the downtown and lo, mainly Los Angeles yeah. area, so it's getting expensive. Yeah, that's for sure. Miguel Almaguer, um, what are we missing on this story? Anything else that surprised you in your course of reporting this out? No, not, you know, we were surprised that so many people had embraced uh, this $400 tax credit that people weren't really surprised about that we were surprised that some experts said hey you know giving the four hundred dollars to every californian if you own an electric car drive a motorcycle isn't a good idea and they also were concerned that there's simply not enough money going to low-wage earners even if you can't afford to have a car you wouldn't get this money but they say they're trying uh -huh. to make some tax breaks on free public transportation it's really kind of a no-win situation here but everyone yeah. is looking for some type of break yeah that's for sure people need relief right no matter what what, uh, what they're doing there so miguel Absolutely. Miguel, thank you friend appreciate it. Good luck Good with your short with commute. You. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Japan and South Korea say North Korea has launched an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile, for the first time since 2017. They think it's a new kind of this kind of missile and a big escalation of the weapons program there. We're going to watch that story. Number two, the sentiment unanimously, Senate unanimously passed a bill today that would promote cannabis research. 
It encourages scientific and medical research on cannabis and federal research into CBD. It would help get FDA-approved marijuana-based medications safely to patients. Number three, data from the Census Bureau shows nearly 75% of counties in the U.S. reported more deaths in the first full year of the pandemic. Mid-2020 to mid-2021 also had massive migration. Big metropolitan areas like New York and L.A. lost hundreds of thousands of people because, as you probably know from reading the news stories about it at the time, a lot of people moved out of big cities at that time. Number four, Miami Beach's state of emergency goes into effect today. It means midnight curfew. It means you can't sell alcohol after 6 o'clock at night. Officials say they're doing this because of a spike in violence with huge spring break crowds. Number five, a jury in Texas found a former Boeing test pilot not guilty on four counts of wire fraud. Mark Forkner had been accused of deceiving federal regulators about a key flight control system, the one that played a role in those two 737 MAX crashes a couple years ago. Coming up next, we're taking you to Poland for a look at what the U.N. is doing to keep the millions of kids who have escaped from Ukraine safe from other dangers. Plus, we have the incredible story of one refugee family who escaped not just one, but now two countries torn apart by war. That's coming up. Coming up next, we go inside the metaverse with Kate Snow with new warnings from experts about what really that is like for kids exploring that universe. That's coming up in just a bit. But tonight, we want to take you over to Poland and Ukraine and put some faces to this growing humanitarian crisis there. The U.N. says more than three and a half million Ukrainians have left the country since the start of the Russian invasion. They're heading to neighboring countries, and now the doors to the United States are opening, too. And here's the thing. This is a story that Fatima Hosseini's family has lived through before. I spoke with Fatima last summer after she and her family, you see her there, managed to leave Afghanistan just seven months ago when the Taliban took over Kabul. It was a chaotic and upsetting exit from the place they called home. You know where they went? To Ukraine. That's where they made their way to. They'd been living there until just recently, and you know what happened. They now are once again, in less than a year, caught in the crossfire of another war, forced to pack their things for the second time and leave everything behind. Here's their story. When the war in Ukraine started, journalist Fatima Hosseini knew she had to get her family to safety fast. My parents, when I was talking to them, they were like, the situation in Ukraine is really getting ugly. So you better do something. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't it's know a dangerous do, journey, right? like one she knows all too well after escaping her home in Afghanistan last summer when the Taliban took control of Kabul. She says she was tear gassed and sexually assaulted. But with the help of a friend and both U.S. and foreign military personnel, she finally boarded a plane to safety to Ukraine, her family joining her in Kiev less than a week later. I met her last fall, an Afghan refugee now living in the U.S., but her family, mom, dad, brother, baby sister, stayed behind in Ukraine. What did you say to those special forces, to the woman who was working with them that helped get you out and that later helped get your family out, too? To be honest, I'm thankful. I'm grateful. They saved my life. If they wouldn't be there, I don't know what would happen to me. Now Fatima's family is reliving a nightmare all over again, leaving Kyiv just a couple weeks ago as the Russians advanced. You and your family are refugees of one war, and now here they are becoming refugees of a second war in less than eight months' time. Yeah, unfortunately. Fatima scrambled, reaching out to friends and strangers, anyone who could get her family to the train station. I could not sleep for three straight nights. And during the day, during daytime, I kept drinking coffee to keep myself awake so that um, there wouldn't be a moment that I would miss any calls. With the help of a Ukrainian friend, the family got on a train heading west towards the Polish border reliving some of those now familiar chaotic scenes. It was so packed that my mother they called me crying, saying that, you know, when the gate of the train opened, people literally were falling down the train because it was so full. Fatima says with the kindness of volunteers and friends, her family made their way to Lviv and then to the Ukrainian-Polish border. But then she lost contact. I did not talk to them for, I think, three hours. And then I received a text from my brother saying they crossed the border and they're in Poland. I was crying that moment. 
The U.N. says more than 3.6 million people in Ukraine have crossed the border into neighboring countries like Poland, Slovakia, Hungary and Romania. Families separated, kids leaving behind their schools, their friends, homes destroyed by Russian artillery. As of mid-March, the International Organization for Migration said 162,000 foreign nationals, like Fatima's family, had escaped Ukraine. She says her mom, dad, brother and sister are now safe in Warsaw, their final destination, Canada. Safe, thanks, Fatima says, to the kindness of strangers. People are amazing. They just want to help, and that's beautiful. It's an incredible story. Fatima says she has not actually seen her parents, her brother, her baby sister since last September before she left Ukraine for the U.S., but she really obviously cannot wait to see them once they get to Canada. Meantime, kids in Ukraine, like Fatima's sister and Ukrainian children, are having to leave their homes every single day. Today, President Biden saying he wants to meet with refugees in Poland as the U.N. says more than half of all kids in Ukraine have been displaced by this war. 4.3 million kids. This includes every child that's left Ukraine, every child that's left their home but is still in the country, too. It also includes orphans. You're looking now at an orphanage in Poland. It used to be a summer camp. Now it's a shelter temporarily for more than 30 kids. The director saying that because of everything that these children have gone through, a lot of his work can start only after the war has ended. We will have a lot of work after the war to overcome psychological trauma of these children who lost their parents. Dasha Burns is with me now. And Dasha, the UN is saying this is one of the fastest large scale displacements of kids since World War II. They're yeah. casting it in these kinds of historical generational terms. Talk to me about what you're seeing today in Poland. Yeah, Hallie, you said it right there. The scale of this cannot be fully described because the numbers we're getting now, they're probably uh, low in terms of the actual estimates. We're going to see those numbers grow as we get a clearer picture of this. But even now, again, one in two children uh, in Ukraine have now been displaced. And I just heard from UNICEF today that about 7,500 children have actually been born into this war. Uh, and Hallie, as you look around Poland, everywhere you see mothers with multiple children, uh, of course, some of the most vulnerable in this crisis. Crisis. There are also a lot of orphans that have crossed the border to seek refuge here. Ukraine has one of the largest orphanage systems uh, in Europe, caring for about 100 thousand children. We met a group of 31 of them earlier this week. You heard from uh, the director of that orphanage who brought them across the border safely. Uh, and he told me that he thinks that there will be more children, more orphans after this yeah. war. He already saw this happen actually in 2014. He says the need for children's homes for those services uh, rose rapidly uh, and, and really uh, overwhelmed them back uh, and when the conflict happened in eastern Ukraine. Ukraine. And some of those same kids that had to flee the East, Hallie, in 2014, are now having to retreat West again. And it's just heartbreaking to watch these children go through trauma over and over again. I'll tell you, though, we saw them singing. We saw them playing. Uh, their resilience continues to amaze, Hallie. Yeah, kids can be so resilient, although they shouldn't have to be, right, in this situation at that age. Um, you know, UNICEF, Dasha, as you know, warned that, that so many kids leaving and becoming refugees could end up being dangerous in other ways, like, for example, with, with concerns over human and trafficking. What have you heard on that front? Yeah. Yeah, look, oh, UNICEF tells me that whenever you have this large scale movement of people, especially of children across the border, the chaos that that creates, you know, there are people out there who uh, are going to try to exploit that. I want you to hear what Joe English, a representative from UNICEF, told me uh, just a couple of hours ago. Take a listen. The risk of, of trafficking, exploitation, abuse, you know, just, just skyrocket. But when there is this level of chaos, you know, the opportunities for them to take advantage of, of some of the most vulnerable is, is huge. Yeah, this is exactly why uh, Mikola, who you heard from earlier, the orphanage director, he says he's registered each one of their children with the Ukrainian embassy. It's what Ukraine is asking uh, them to do. Ukraine has also put uh, adoptions on hold right now. It's also something UNICEF recommends to not do overseas adoption in a time of war and really just focusing right now on make sure, making sure each of these kids is accounted for and that 
their parents, their family members, those who have been separated from family, that everyone knows where these children are, which is so difficult in a time when there's yeah. so uh, much movement of people. Hallie. Dasha Burns, live for us there in Poland. Dasha, thank you. I want to take you now to the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, Kate Snow took a look at how kids across the U.S. are interacting with virtual reality platforms. This new report is out warning there's a lot of dangers in places like the metaverse that might end up being harmful for kids and that the safety protocols that companies have in place just can't keep up. We're talking about the watchdog group Common Sense Media. They say VR could expose kids to physiological dangers, to privacy violations, to misinformation, even sexual content and psychological risks. We've talked about the metaverse before, right? If you watch this show, you know it's this universe of VR spaces. You can interact as an avatar. Anybody 13 and older can make an account if they have a headset. You just saw our own Kate Snow putting on her headset. She went into some of these virtual reality platforms to check out these concerns for herself. I am a reporter, yes. I'm trying to understand the metaverse. Uh, you should not have come in here. God have mercy, bless your soul. The maker of VR Chat, the one you just saw Kate in in that clip, told NBC News harmful content would be removed from their platform as soon as it was reported. And Meta, which makes the headset, pretty popular headset that Kate wore, had not seen the report when we asked for comment, but said they want everyone using their products to be able to easily find tools to help them when rules are broken. They say they're have, planning on having parental supervision tools ready to go in the next few months. Kate joins me now to talk about this. Kate, this is super interesting. Let me start here with how you got to do the reporting in the metaverse in the first place. When you're, you know, an avatar interacts with an avatar, is it just like walking up to somebody like I as a reporter would walk up to like a, you know, a source or a contact? Yeah, well, first, let me say, as a mom of two teenagers, I really did not understand what the metaverse was. Really? Hallie, I think a lot kids? of parents don't. Did your teens, did, are they in it? Yeah, do they get my, it? Son, my, they don't have, we don't have the headset in our home, but my son, who's 19, knew all, knew all about yeah. it. So, look. I went in with a producer and with someone from Commons, like a producer helped me set it up, and then Common Sense Media, you saw a guy, maybe you didn't see him, but from his point of view, he was shooting the video that you just watched, um, and he was my guide. And so he took me to certain areas uh, in the metaverse, which of course is just the universe of virtual reality where people right. interact with each other. Um, and so, yeah, when I walked up to people, I identified myself as a reporter because that's one of our, as you know, Hallie, one of our standards of practices that we always ID ourselves as a reporter um, with the uh, there was a young man in one of the universes that you actually see with me there um, he identified himself as a, a boy who was 13 um, we tried to reach his parents by the way to get comment from them and we were were not able to reach them but we, we, we hid the identities you saw we blurred out the usernames on purpose yeah. but I did interact with people um, to try to figure out what was going on inside there. And then you, sh you saw that clip, Hallie, of the strip club that we went to. And I have to tell you, it was extremely disturbing. There were a lot of things in there that we couldn't show on television. I, and as a mom yourself, had you, yeah. you know, had you expected that, Kate? I mean, you know, the, the no. Watchdog report had warned about troubling things <laughs> yeah. in the metaverse, you know? Yeah, not, not, I didn't expect the visceral reaction that I would have. Mm. So, and people who've been in the metaverse and virtual reality probably know this, but it's a very experiential thing. You're in there, you're hearing, you're seeing, it, it, you feel like you're there and people are coming right up in your space. That's been one of the issues with the metaverse is, and one of the concerns of, of common sense media is that kids can be kind of, your personal space can be infringed upon, um, not to mention all the things that you can see when you're in there. How was it when you were going to these companies asking for comment, right, Kate? Because mm -hmm. I think in the, in the reporting that I've done on, on other issues as it relates to tech companies, there is sometimes this sense of, you know, they're, they're trying to put these safety protocols in place, but there is some responsibility that falls on the, on the user, if you will. Talk to me about that piece of it. Yeah, and I think there's some responsibility on the Today Show piece this morning. We talked about parental responsibility for all of this. Um, and, I, you know, some in the industry would say, look, parents need to be moderating what their kids are looking at. Don't sign your kid up if they're not 13 years old and over. But the, the issue in talking to the companies, and they were very they were very forthcoming with us, I have to say. You just you quoted two of the statements that we got. They were very responsive to us. That was not an issue. But the technology, Hallie, is moving faster than they can even keep up with. Um, you know, you, you mentioned their meta told us that they will be putting out more parental tools, but they're not ready yet. Um, the technology's kind of expanded quicker than they can get the parental tools out there. 
Kate Snow. Thank you so much. Um, it's a fascinating look, and I appreciate you joining us with the behind-the-scenes look at how this all yeah. came together. Appreciate it, friend. Thanks. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out West, Idaho's governor signed an abortion bill similar to Texas's controversial abortion law. Idaho's bill lets family members of a, quote, pre-born child sue doctors who perform abortions after a heartbeat is detected, roughly after about six weeks of pregnancy. They can be sued for a minimum of $20,000. This will go into effect in 30 days, but even the governor has said he thinks this law will be proven unconstitutional. Also from our West Coast Bureau, the California State University school system is permanently tossing out SAT and ACT requirements for admission. During the height of the pandemic, it scrapped the test temporarily, but CSU's chancellor says he hopes this move helps level the playing field and gives students from all backgrounds more access to getting degrees from colleges. And from our Northeast Bureau, soon you'll be able to find a yellow New York taxi on your Uber app. This is part of a new partnership. It's because Uber is dealing with some driver shortages and a surge in orders of food deliveries, right? The company hopes this will boost the number of rides available and make things a little less tense, a little less awkward between Uber and taxi services. If you dine out a lot, you're gonna to wanna to listen to this next story. A Consumer Reports investigation found dangerous chemicals in a lot of the fast food packaging some of us buy. The chemicals are called PFAS. Sometimes they're called forever chemicals by some folks because scientists say they're practically unbreakable compounds that just won't go away. Consumer Reports, a nonprofit, says PFAS is found in things like the stuff shown in this graphic here, right? From Arby's, Burger King, Chick-fil-A, Taco Bell, Sweet Green, etc. Paper bags for French fries, wrappers for sandwiches, salad bowls, paper plates. Scientists say repeated PFAS exposure can increase the risk for some cancers. They're also li risk linked to lower birth weights for infants. One of the world's biggest fast food companies, now Restaurant Brands International, the owner of Burger King, Popeyes, and Tim Hortons, says it'll stop using packaging that has this kind of chemical. Kristen Dahlgren is following the story for us tonight. Kristen, PFAS is interesting. There's, it's in a lot of stuff, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's a PFAS story when it comes to beauty products, for example, that I think a lot of people know about. They're in these food wrappers. Now they go in the trash, end up in our water system, et cetera. First, give us the context check, right? And then tell us why this is significant, what this big international food group is doing. Right. And so, you know, these really are just in everything because they've been in use since 1938. And at the time, you know, it was found as this forever chemical. It made packaging um, really more durable. Uh, it made it heat resistant and wouldn't corrode. And so you could put things in it like salad dressings, like oils, you know, French fries, and it wouldn't go through the packaging. And so for our culture, on the go, you know, that seemed ideal. Obviously, now we know better and we're seeing some of the fallout uh, from this. And, you know, we're talking about fast food wrappers, but that also includes things that you buy in a supermarket, the tray under your cake, uh, those sort of fiber bowls that your salad may come in. And it's really hard because these don't break down to then get them out of our environment. And so we have them in use and there's a, a push to stop that. Uh, but we also then have it in our environment, in our water, in many cases, in our soil that's being used for crops. And so this really is concerning. I, I definitely recommend checking out this Consumer Reports uh, reporting to see the places that, you know, viewers may frequent. Uh, yeah. They can see what products it was found in. I can tell you that, you know, here, here in Washington, there's, there's oftentimes discussion of PFAS that comes up and this push to try to get Congress to do something. It, it, it's, it's been a slow process, I think it's fair to say, Kristen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a petition that people can go online and sign, and there is this push to try and get the government to regulate it. California recently instituted a ban on intentionally putting PFAS uh, into products that takes effect in 2023, and the level they set is 100 parts per million. Uh, just to give you some context there, Denmark also has a ban, and they've set their level at 20 parts per million. Uh, that is the level that the experts Consumer Reports talked to really thought getting it below that would be important uh, for health. So, you know, this push to make it happen, it has been painfully slow, though, Holly. So I, I hesitate to even ask you about the timeline moving forward to, like, get something done as it relates to PFAS. I mean, we talked about Restaurant Brands International doing something. That is obviously a step in that direction. But, like, I mean, it feels like we're talking a generation before change, no? 
Well, I mean, hopefully, and these these big groups, you know, you, you talked about them. That's Burger King, Tim Hortons, right. Popeyes, and and so um, some of those that tested with it in there, they vowed to get it out of their products by 2025. So some of these big restaurant groups are making the effort to stop putting it in intentionally. Again, there's this push for the government then to set a level so that nobody can do that and it doesn't come down uh, to the public pressure on the restaurants. But it is going to be a slow process. You know, these are chemicals that don't break down and so they are in the environment and how that's remediated is another piece of this. Things people can do, you know, they can frequent restaurants that have vowed not to have this um, they can test their water because it can be in, in household water. It's also in things like carpet. So, you know, there are things that the consumer to, can do eating home more maybe uh, rather than getting takeout as much. And then when you get those containers, take your food out of it as quickly as possible and don't cook it. So things we can do pushes to make this a uh, more permanent thing, Hallie. Kristen Dahlgren, um, that's great advice. Good information. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So Kate Middleton and Prince William are in the Bahamas today the last stop of a Caribbean tour that's turned into kind of a controversial trip. They're celebrating Queen Elizabeth's 70 years on the throne. And while they have gotten a warm welcome in some spots, a lot of people from these former British colonies are just not that into it. First, it was protests in Belize, right? You see them here then. Two days before getting to Jamaica, the two of them, a coalition of prominent Jamaicans wrote an open letter saying, during the 70 years on the throne, your grandmother has done nothing to atone for the suffering of our ancestors that took place during her reign. Prince William then apologizing for slavery last night. I want to express my profound sorrow. Slavery was abhorrent and it should never have happened. Kathy Park is covering this now live for us from London. Kathy, you know, the, these, the, the intention, I think, of, of a royal trip like this, particularly for the Queen's 70 years on the throne, was supposed to be sort of excitement, you know. Now there's some backlash. People are calling for reparations. Walk us through this. Hey, Hallie, that's exactly right. So uh, royal experts are calling this a charm offensive for uh, William and Kate because they're essentially ambassadors for the queen to strengthen relationships with these Commonwealth countries. But even before they landed this past weekend, they were met with protests. Uh, I'll start with Belize. They were, they were supposed to, to go to a, a village, but some of the villagers there, they were upset because there's this longstanding land dispute with a conservation group, and Prince William happened to be a patron of this organization. They were also upset that the royal were planning on landing their helicopter on their property without permission ahead of time. So eventually the royals had to do a detour and went to a different farm instead. And then to Jamaica, as you mentioned, they were also met with protests. Uh, dozens of people, they were in Kingston. They were demanding an apology and reparations for Britain's ties to slavery. And William had the, the, the task of addressing this head on in a keynote speech. And he fell short of, of issuing a full apology and he received some backlash for that. And then on top of of all of this, Hallie, the prime minister of Jamaica indicated that they were moving forward or taking the initial steps to remove the queen as a head of state. So for Kate and William, it certainly has been difficult to navigate this royal tour. It feels like this may be something we could see more of, right, from countries that the queen still reigns over. Is there any sense of that after what you just talked about, Barbados removing her as a head of state, what, what you talked about in Jamaica, too? Yeah, so... Royal experts are, are worried there is some sort of movement happening. Uh, we, we saw Barbados, uh, Jamaica could potentially be next. And, and, and listen, this for the Queen is a crowning achievement for her to strengthen these relationships with these Commonwealth countries. So um, the experts are, are worried that she will be upset. And, and obviously moving forward, you know, it remains to be seen. But right now, right now, it seems like the, these Commonwealth nations, it seems to be unraveling at this point. Kathy Allie? Park, live for us there outside Buckingham Palace. Kathy, thank you for being with us and for bringing that to us. Appreciate it. Appreciate all of you for joining us too. Did that hour fly by? It felt like it did. We're going to have a lot more for you here tomorrow. Same time, same place. It's been a busy week and we'll cap it off with you on Friday. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.